by giving you some. You don't have to hold that up just yet. Yeah, not um, yet. Not yet. I'm going to start by giving you some general information about the neighborhood. And I have a wonderful visual aid here for you. Uh, this map was done by Historic Newton. And it shows the neighborhood in about the year 1917. And the colors are um, green, blue, red, and yellow. And there's a legend at the bottom. The green is for the Irish, the red for the French the blue for Jews and the yellow for Italians. And what they did was they put little stickers on the map to show you where people lived and what the population was like in that year. It is not 100% uh, because the little stickers took up a lot of room. It's not every single house. But when you look at the map, you get a real idea of what the neighborhood was like in 1917. So you can pass this around to look at. And if you have questions, we will try to answer your questions. Um, okay. I, a little map for those of you who may not be from the neighborhood. This little section up here is Nonanta. Newton has 13 villages, most of which are pretty <laughs> <coughs> indistinguishable from each other. They all seem to be pretty much the same. Nonantum is very, very different. So this is just to give you an idea of where you are in the city of Newton. If you keep going down Watertown Street, you end up in Watertown. If you go right off of Watertown Street, you end up in Newton Corner. So if that helps to orient you a little bit. Now, this location was originally, we're going to stand here and talk a little bit before we move because of the heat. Uh, we're going to try to stay in the shade as much as we can. This area was originally a site for what were called the Praying Indians. Indians who had been converted to Christianity in the 17th century by John Eliot, um, who was called the Apostle to the Indians. Eliot Memorial Church is named for him. Um, and this was established in 1647 as a place for the Indians to live away from white people. They didn't want them uh, affected by the, the white people. Um, this village, the village of Nonantum, is the most densely populated of all of the villages in Newton with a population of about 4,000. It is also the most diverse in ethnic terms and it is also the site where Newton had its largest concentration of business and industry. And that was because of the mills that used the water power from the Charles River. The Charles River is over there. Also, Newton is one of the first bedroom suburbs. That it was a bedroom suburb. You could work in Boston and commute at the end of the day due to the railroad. The railroad runs down Washington Street, the commuter rail that still uses those tracks was first laid in 1834. So you can imagine Newton, even as late as 1885, is still very countrified. And California Street and Craft Street are referred to as picturesque country lanes. <laughs> so you can imagine that this area looked very, very different at that time. This is a community. What is a community? It is an area that has a limited geographic de designation, common social facts, and associations. We, this community shares geographic locations, certain socioeconomic facts, but it also is very different in terms of ethnic and religious affiliations. This um, neighborhood has been home to Catholics and Jews, French speakers, Yiddish speakers, and Italian speakers, and Russian speakers as well. It, it is a community, but it's a very different kind of community. It's one big community with little ethnic pockets. Let me give you a few statistics, just roughly, to give you a, a sweep. In the year 1885, the population was almost 20,000. 
there were 190 black residents in Newton, but they didn't live around here. They lived over near St. Bernard's Church, where Myrtle Baptist Church is now. The census recorded 31 churches, five Italians, and one Chinese man. Um, now, the mills provided uh, jobs for local residents, and the housing that they built for the local residents were usually small four-room houses, two up, two down houses. If you walk this way toward Walnut Street and Linwood and that area, you see these beautiful, gorgeous, big Victorian houses. Believe me, that was not where the poor people lived. Uh, you can, as you drive down Watertown Street, you can see the neighborhood change from the homes of the wealthy to the homes of the workers. Now, the immigrants who came here came in waves. There would be a wave of some group. The first two came were the Irish, and they founded St. John, uh, they founded Our Lady's Church in 1873, followed by the French. Did you know that there was a large French community here in Newton? Well, you're going to hear about it. <laughs> um, then the Italians and finally the Jewish immigrants who arrived around the turn of the 20th century. These were separate groups, as you'll see from the map. They lived literally side by side. There were no only one type of people living in one neighborhood. But they worshipped in separate religious institutions. They shopped in different stores. And these stores and institutions changed over time. In 1901, there were 40 churches in Newton, but no synagogue. This year, there are approximately 56 churches in Newton and 15 synagogues. So you can see that things have changed. In 1889, the most popular groups, the most populous groups in, in Nonanta were French and um, English and Irish. Now, you didn't know there were French people here. They had a building on Dalby Street. We may not walk all the way down to Dalby Street. If you go to Dalby Street today and you turn onto Dalby Street, on the left-hand side, there's a new two-family house. That is the site of what they originally called Lafayette Hall. There were over 500 French speakers here in Newton in the year 1911. Um, they had Lafayette Hall, which then became a French church called Saint Jean l'Evangeliste. They built a church here on Watertown Street. They had a French speaking parochial school until 1967 in Saint Jean. They said masses in French and Latin. So there was a very large, very well established French community here in Newton. Now, there were the Irish. The French came after the Irish, and the French and the Irish didn't get along for a number of reasons. Number one, they couldn't speak to each other. A lot of the French people spoke French, not English. Number two, they lived very separate lives. The French tended to live on... There was a... Now come the Italians. You're used to thinking about this place as being an Italian neighborhood. But in fact, it really wasn't all Italian. There was a lot of animosity between the Irish and the Italians. Number one, language barriers. Uh, number two, the two groups competed with each other for jobs. They were all semi-skilled laborers, or, or they were ditch diggers. Some of them were masons. But it was mostly unskilled and semi-skilled labor, so they were in direct competition with each other for jobs. Um, interestingly enough, there was also religious friction between them. At that time, the church was dominated by the Irish, not only locally in Our Ladies, but by the whole Archdiocese of Boston. And the Italians found the Irish very snobby and, and not emotional enough, and so they didn't really mingle there either. For many, many years at, at Our Ladies, the Irish worshipped upstairs and the Italians worshipped downstairs. <laughs> Uh, they tried to change that finally in the 1930s. The church sent an Irish priest who spoke Italian to the neighborhood. 
and that made it possible for him to communicate better with many of the um, many of the of the of the Italian residents who may not have spoken English very well. It reminded me a little bit about Father Cunin's career uh, at the church also. Uh, the Jewish community and the French community pretty much they didn't disappear. There were and there still are French and Jewish residents, but by World War II, the area really was dominated by the Italians. Now, you think it's always been Italian, but in 1885, there were only five Italians in this neighborhood, and in 1895, there were only 134 Italians in the whole city of Newport. It steadily increases. In 1905, there were about 150 to 200 Italians living in Nonantum. In 1910, out of a population of about 4,000, there were about 300 Italians, but over 500 French speakers and almost 200 Jewish uh, Yiddish speakers. Um, by 1920, there were about 700 Italians, and the Irish population increases steadily from that date. In 1970, the census said that 64% of the neighborhood was Italian, but by 1990, the Italian population was only 39%, and I suspect now that it's probably about 25%. However, the Italians are very civic-minded, have done a lot for the neighborhood. You see that they've painted on Adams Street, um, they painted the three colored stripes down the street, they paint the fire hydrants, uh, the colors of the Italian flag. This park that we are standing in is called Magni Coletti Park. It is named for two men of the Magni and Coletti families who were prominent local families who died in World War II. And the war memorials in Newton are all the result of activities by the Italian community. Uh, Post 440, for example, on, on, um, on California Street, uh, and, and others are, are, the, are the result of members of this community who went to the city and said, we want this memorial, you need to give us a little bit of land, uh, we're going to put up a, a, a plaque to honor the people there, etc. So, we're going to walk toward uh, Watertown Street. Well, first, I want to show you a few pictures. You can pass these around. This building is Lafayette Hall. And, and I'm going to pass these around. Please be sure to give them back. Um, Lafayette Hall was the site of uh, first Lafayette Hall. Then it was a, as a community center. Then it became the church. And then it became the Newton Boys and Girls Club until the Boys and Girls Club moved further down Watertown Street. These are some pictures of businesses um, that were on Watertown Street. This is a department store called Perry's that was owned by a Jewish family. And the other one is Fox Furniture. Uh, and this is an ad for Fox Furniture in 1911. And they are advertising record players. <laughs> so the idea that this was a very poor neighborhood, it wasn't always poor. It was working class. But people who lived here probably had fairly steady employment in the early years, and so they were <laughs> eager to have the very latest kinds of uh, things that, um, that everybody else had. Now, we're going to walk. The question is, do you want to walk down there, look at some of the stores, talk about Watertown Street, or would you like to stay in the shade and talk about Watertown Street? <coughs> Raise your hands. Day, you want to stay day. in the shade, <laughs> teacher? <laughs> okay. I want to talk about the development of the businesses on Watertown Street. When you walk down Watertown Street today, uh, you see a lot of businesses. What I've done is I tried to convey to you the way in which the Jewish community dominated the business life on Watertown Street really until about the 19, late 1920s or 1930s. What I did was I made three of these, one from 1900, one from 1911, and one from 1921. The colors match the colors on that map that we were looking at. 
The green is for the Irish, the yellow for the Italians, the red for the French, and the blue for the Jewish community. Now, obviously, the street doesn't look, you know, if I'd made something this wide, it would be very clumsy. So, it, the numbers start high and go low, and it identifies some of the kinds of businesses that were available. Interesting, at one point there were 17 Chinese laundries in Newton. Mm -hmm. um, they were not all on Watertown Street, but in fact in 1900 there was a um, there was a Chinese laundry here, and in 1921 I think there were two Chinese laundries. So that's another um, indication, by the way, of finances that if you could afford to send your stuff out to have it cleaned, everybody didn't have washing machines. So the Chinese laundry, people, as soon as they could afford it, would send, for example, sheets and towels, heavy stuff, out to be washed. So the fact that there were always Chinese laundries in the neighborhood is another indication of the financial stability, not necessarily richness, but financial stability of the neighborhood. So you can look at these and get an idea of the kinds of businesses that were around here. Um, the Jewish businesses were uh, primarily, uh, the big businesses were what they called department stores. Department store was a fancy name uh, that was pioneered um, by Macy's, in fact. Um, it was the idea that the store had everything. It had many departments. These were not true department stores. They had mostly clothing and household items like linens and towels and sheets and things like that. But it made them sound really nice, and it was very modern and it was very up to date. There were a lot of Jewish businesses that were called department stores. There were also a lot of small Jewish businesses, tailor, primarily tailors and shoemakers were the, the, two, um, the two major small businesses. Um, and I, I want to start by talking a little bit about some of the businesses that might still be around. Number one is Swartz Hardware. Swartz Hardware was founded on Watertown Street in the year 1890. It is probably one of the oldest businesses in Newton. Uh, still in business, it is run now by the grandson of the original founder. Um, until about two or three years ago, there was a, far a pharmacy over there. It was for a while, it was called, it was first Fox Pharmacy, then Eaton's, then Walgreens bought it and closed it down. Fox Pharmacy was a Jewish business that was established in Newton about 1902. And it was, so it had a long history until Walgreens got a hold of it. Um, to give you a sense of, of those maps that I've passed around, from Swartz Hardware to where Antoine's Bakery is, was like a Jewish block, or Jewish two blocks. Antoine's was Freed's department store. And anybody who has lived in this neighborhood has probably heard stories about the Freed's, about Sammy Freed specifically. Um, I want to mention also that there is a, a business down there called Civil Lake Liquors owned by John Negrotti. Mr. Negrotti's grandfather, John Negrotti, had a business on Watertown Street from about the year 1900. So John, uh, Mr. Negrotti was sold fruit and vegetables, but John has, his family has been in business on this street for over 100 years. There's also a business on the street now that is old business, but new to Nonantum, it's called Stoddard's, and they are a, uh, a cutlery shop. They sell knives and cutlery, and that company was established in the year 1800. They are the fourth oldest business in the greater Boston area and the oldest cutlery shop in the United States. They've been here at the lake about three or four years. For a long time, they were in the uh, Chesapeake Hill Mall. They were in the Prudential Mall downtown, and they decided they didn't like being in malls. They came, they came here because they wanted to be in a neighborhood. And uh, they're very professional and very skilled people, and it's good to know that they are here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of businesses 
that people had here in this general neighborhood. Oh, I wanted to mention, by the way, that um, if you go down to Bridge Street, uh, there's a picture here that I'm going to show you in a minute. Bridge Street, originally there was a fire station on the corner of Bridge Street. When the fire station was torn down, they built a library there. Oh, is that? Sorry, I'm a little disoriented. Okay, over there um, is the library on the other side of the park. Um, it is no longer a new library. It serves at the moment as an Italian cultural center, but I understand that that is moving and the city is taking it over. Um, and then if you keep walking until you get to Antoine's, that's the heart of the shopping district of the business district. And it, the business district has not changed, but the kind of businesses and who ran them have changed a lot. Um, off of Watertown Street, for example, on West Street, there were six Jewish junk dealers, a Jewish grocer, and a Jewish tailor. So there were small businesses on the side streets um, as well, but most of the businesses, as you can imagine, you want a, a really going business, you want to be on the main street. Uh, junk dealers did not need to be on the main street. There was a blacksmith on this street uh, for many, many years. His name was Samuel Bram, and later he developed an, another business on the corner of Walnut Street and Washington Street, there's a building called the Graham Building with, with the clock, and, and that was where he was located for a number of years. Okay. I, I like the idea that there was a milliner, a French lady who made hats on, on, Wash, on Watertown Street. Again, these were working people, but that doesn't mean that they had no resources. And especially in those days, ladies always wore hats to church. And so there was a French milliner. I just, I just love that. Um, there were French barbers. There were different kinds of grocery stores. Um, oh, and another little thing is there was a billiard parlor next door to Swartz Hardware. Flaherty's Billiard Parlor. Now, <laughs> Today, billiards is a very classy thing, you know, but in those days, it was a very, considered to be a very lower class activity. And middle class people and upper class people looked down upon billiard parlors, we also sometimes call them pool parlors. Uh, those people shouldn't be sitting around playing pool, they should be out working. Or they shouldn't be sitting around maybe drinking beer and playing pool, they should be out working. So I think it's really interesting that probably for about 20 years or more, on Watertown Street, there was a billiard parlor owned by Mr. Flaherty. And I, I like the idea that there was such a thing. It gives a little bit of flavor to, to the neighborhood. Um, just briefly, I mentioned about the Chinese laundries. Um, in 1990, there were 416 Asians on the census in Newtown. There are now, including South Asians, people from India, over 10,000. Uh, the, uh, the, the Asian and South Asian population of Newton is around 10 to 12 percent now, which is an enormous change from 1885 when there was one Chinese man living in the, in the town. Um, Okay, just very briefly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, two, three things. Okay, number one, this is a community made up of people from many different backgrounds, many different ethnic groups. And you see the ways in which they interacted with each other, sometimes alone in, in more isolated ways, but they were living side by side. You couldn't avoid the neighbors all around you. And there are a couple of people that I want to mention who had a big impact on this neighborhood. One is Sam Freed. Freed's department store was a little, was a dry goods store. He sold clothing and sheets and towels and stuff like that. He was like Santa Claus to the people in this neighborhood. If you were, your child was going to have a first communion at the church, 
And you didn't have the money to buy the shoes or the dress or the little suit. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, they'd knock on the door and there'd be a box on your doorstep. Your child should not be ashamed in front of his friends because you might have been short of money and couldn't afford to pay. He knew you would pay when you could. In addition, Sam, I don't know all about this stuff, okay. Um, he taught local kids how to drive. Not everybody had a car. And if you wanted to get around, it might be important. Maybe to get a job, you needed to be able to drive. So he would take kids out and teach them how to drive. If a local kid got into trouble and went to jail, Sam would go and visit him in jail. And when he came out, Sam would try and help him find a job. He helped people study for the citizenship test so that they could become American citizens. He was so important. Now, these were not Jewish primarily. Sure, they were Jewish people who needed help as well. But primarily, they were not Jewish people. And when he died, Father Robichaud, who was the priest at the French Catholic Church, said a mass for him. He had that kind of an impact on the people in his neighborhood. The other person I would like to mention, of course, we cannot be standing in an Italian park without mentioning Fat Pellegrini. Fat was the institutional version of Sammy Fried. Sammy worked on his own. He did individual things for individual people, was involved with every part of the community. Fat did things for the whole community. Um, the major events, the, the Nonantum, Christmas Children's Party, and the Senior Citizens Picnic and Barbecue that he used to run every year. He also worked with members of every organization in the community. Um, he worked with the, the, uh, with the American Legion. He worked with the St. Mary of Carmen Society. He worked with the neighborhood associations. And the estimates that he, over his lifetime um, of service to this community, that he raised and distributed probably about a million dollars. And nobody has come forward in this neighborhood. Oh, and of course you all all know about the competing Memorial Day parades. Um, he did not feel that the city honored its Nonantum neighbors enough. And besides, the parade was way over there. We don't live over there. We live over here. Uh, so for many, many years, there were two Memorial Day parades, and he always used to say that his parade was much better than theirs. <laughs> um, nobody has come forward, and perhaps that is a measure of how the neighborhood has changed, how community has changed, um, that nobody has come forward to take his place uh, to, to demonstrate the community spirit that existed here in this neighborhood. Um, I want to just very, very briefly point out this. This is part of an historic exhibit that was at the Newton History Museum, and it features, number one, information about the Schwartz family. That gentleman with the bowler hat is Mr. Jacob Schwartz, founder of Schwartz Hardware. Um, these two pictures, this picture was taken in 1911, and this picture was taken this year, this is the view of Watertown Street then and the view now, and it really has not changed at all. Um, since I was one of the people doing the exhibit, I threw in my family. This is my grandfather. We're going to talk about the synagogue in a minute. This is my grandfather, founder of the synagogue, uh, and this is my father. Um, my father was born on 59 Clinton Street. Uh, one of Newton's traditional, or Nonantum's traditional four-room houses, and in 1912 the family moved to 93 West Street. If you go down West Street, there's a big blue house on the right-hand side. That's where he grew up. Um, right, a, so you can you walk down there and uh, see uh, something about these old houses. Has everyone had a chance to see these old maps? Thank you. Okay. Um, 
We're going to walk down now to the synagogue. Anyone who's interested, I'm going to do a tour of the synagogue. Come in, and you'll come inside, and I'll talk to you about the history of the of the Jewish community, which I really didn't touch on here because I knew I was going to do it later. Um, and uh, and and as we're walking down down Adam Street, most Newton walking tours consist of oh look at the pretty houses. No, Nantum doesn't have very many pretty houses. This is working class area and working class housing. There are a couple of houses on Adam Street that I will point out as we're walking toward the synagogue. The traditional housing in this neighborhood were four room houses. Two rooms on the first floor, two rooms on the second floor. Um, if the house was connected to the sewer system, the toilet was in the basement. Many of those houses over the years have been added to so that they are no longer just four rooms. Usually they added a bathroom off the kitchen on the first floor. Uh, Sometimes they have expanded it uh, in the back, etc. But that was the traditional house. There was a room that we might have called the parlor or the living room and a kitchen. The stairs to the second floor were in the kitchen. There were two bedrooms on the second floor. In my father's house, uh, the girls slept upstairs in one bedroom and mommy and daddy slept in the other bedroom and the boys slept in what was called the living room. Um, and that was, but you know, you say, oh, four rooms, how could people live? How could you have 10 children living in a house with four rooms? The answer is that in many cases, this was better housing than what they left behind. Um, my grandmother, for example, was born in a house that had a dirt floor. When she came here and she had running water in her kitchen and a wooden floor in her house, that was a step up. Might be a small house, but it was an improvement. If you talk, um, if you read about, don't, don't bend it like that, it spoils the pictures. Um, in, uh, if you talk to the Italians, many of them came from houses with one room. Many of the Irish came from houses that were made of peat blocks and thatch. So even though these were not beautiful houses, in many cases they were actually improvements over where they had been. And as soon as people had money, they started adding and you know, the way we all do. So we can walk down Adam Street as we're walking down Adam Street, the first house you'll see on the right, on the right hand side is a little brick house. It was originally a four room house and made of wood. Over the years they added to it on the side, they added on the back, they put a brick facade on it, but originally it was a four room house. And so you get a little bit of an idea um, about what the neighborhood was like. If you want to uh, walk a little bit further down Adams Street. On the right hand side is Quirk Court. Quirk Court was built in the 1880s as housing for workers. Some of them have three stories or two stories and an attic. And they were filled with individual rumors, individual people living in these houses. They were like boarding houses. And there was no, you, you shouldn't walk down the street, you can't drive down Quirk Court or Maguire Court. Um, they're, they're very small, but you will see that how, talk about zoning, you know, and setbacks and all the things that we think now are so important to the housing. Uh, you will see that there, there were no setbacks, there was no zoning. Um, but you get an idea of how people lived in those days and I think that I have, let me look. Wait a minute. Yep, here it is. Okay. This is Quirk Court in 1890. And it does it hasn't changed a lot. Um, it was a very narrow street then. It is a very narrow street now. Um, so, okay. Any questions so far? I was hoping that there'd be a lot of neighborhood people to correct me and tell me all the things I got wrong. <laughs> no. Okay, if you want to head over toward the